So 2018, it's a new year, and what better way to commemorate a new year than talking about old professional wrestling? Am I right? Am I right? But in all seriousness, I enjoy doing retro wrestling reviews because it's an opportunity to take a look back through the scope of history, take a look back at things that have happened that have led to where we are now. It's also fun to take a look back sometimes and see how much better I feel like things used to be, but then on the flip side, poke holes in things that came up short and ended up leaving us disappointed then and only disappoint us more now through the scope of said history. Which brings me to January 4th, 2010, eight years ago today as of this recording. Can you believe it? It was going to be a new Monday Night War for professional wrestling. It was going to be WWE PG style versus TNA in Impact Wrestling. This felt like the Goodwill Salvation Army version of the old Monday Night Wars, but let's not dismiss it totally. This was an exciting night in the history of professional wrestling. I argue that it was the single most exciting and interesting night that the professional wrestling business had seen in nine or ten years, and to this day, there has not been a more interesting, compelling day of wrestling since. And while it's easy to look back through the scope of history and end up being disappointed by what could have been but ultimately wasn't, this was still a big deal. This was still a huge night. On the WWE side, you had Bret Hart coming back to the WWE as the guest host of Monday Night Raw, back with the company in official capacity in any way outside of the Hall of Fame induction a few years before, for the first time since Survivor Series 1997. One of those things you wondered if it would ever happen, Bret Hart was going to be on Monday Night Raw. And on the flip side... Impact Wrestling, TNA, they were going to Monday nights. They were doing a three-hour show this particular night, if you remember. And it was all going to revolve around the major earth-shattering news of bringing in the single biggest name in the history of the professional wrestling business, Hulk Hogan. It felt like it could be one of those potentially landscape-changing, culture-changing events and nights for the company that was TNA. This was a big deal. This was an exciting night. And even with all of the disappointment that goes along with it, it still ends up being an exciting night. But really, when you look back, truly disappointing. And we'll start off with Impact Wrestling. We'll start off with TNA. In large part because they were up first that night. If you remember... They were running three hours. They were going to have an hour lead-in before Monday Night Raw. So this was a major opportunity, a major chance for this company, this brand, this product, this show that was going to have more eyeballs than it had ever had on it at any point in time in history to sit there and make a statement, basically give an hour-long introduction for a little bit of insight in terms of what that brand has been, what it's been about, and what the future could potentially hold with Hulk Hogan calling the shots as a part of TNA. This was significant. This was important. Knowing more people than ever were going to be watching this product, they Russoed it in a Russo type of way. You start off with the fan reactions talking about Hogan coming to TNA and all the excitement that it was generating and the buzz it was generating. And they did this a couple of times throughout the night. And you look and it's the people of Walmart and Dollar General and so forth. But hey, you know what? You're trying to build up the excitement for what's to come later in the night. What you don't do, though, is kick off with your first match being that ridiculous-ass Steel Asylum match. It's an eight-man match just visually looks terrible. Like, I understand. You want to establish yourself as being different. You want to establish yourself as being counterculture to WWE. This was not the way to do it. 
People had no clue that maybe we're tuning in for the first time why this match was even happening, why you would care about any of the participants. And while it's funny to go back and see Consequences Creed and Jay Lethal and so on and so forth, the simple fact of the matter is this match was a fitting opening that represented so many things that this company had been about the previous seven and a half years before. Dumb decisions, horrible thought process, and terrible execution. You have the Steel Asylum eight-man match where is the whole purpose to pin somebody? Is the whole purpose to escape out of the top of the cage? Who knows? Who cares? Because we didn't really bother to explain it or focus on it. Because after a few minutes, here goes Homicide hitting a bunch of people with a stick. And it's a freaking Steel Asylum match and we have a disqualification. Like, who writes this shit? Who books this shit? A disqualification in an eight-man glorified steel cage match. And then, to top it all off, after Homicide goes crazy and hits a bunch of people with a freaking stick, he has his own Jack Swagger freaking moment before Jack Swagger had his moment a couple months later at WrestleMania 26 because he tries to climb up through the top of the cage and he can't freaking get out, eventually dropping, only after everybody else gets to their senses and realizes what's going on, awkwardly tries to climb up the cage to where Homicide eventually drops and then they all climb down like, what the fuck just happened? And then, to top it all off, this is the spot, this is the moment where you decide to bring in Jeff Hardy, who at the time was truly the hottest free agent in professional wrestling. He was a big freaking deal, a mega star. One that there wasn't a lot of in wrestling at that time. TNA has freaking Jeff Hardy. And instead of making it this huge spectacular deal and using that as the real kickoff to being one of these things of saying, you never know what could happen. That's why you gotta tune in every week. You botch the fuck out of his debut. You send him at Homicide. Homicide hits him. Then Jeff Hardy hits Homicide in the head with a steel chair shot from hell. And then Jeff Hardy climbs up top of the cage the whole time on his face looking like, Oh my God, why did I come back to this company? Oh my God, why do I agree to this shit? And he sits there on top of the red cage looking all tights of perplexed and flummoxed just like we all were. This was the opportunity, the first real impression that this company could make. And they did it with the disqualification in a steel asylum match where the whole premise was for Homicide to not be able to climb out of the top of the damn cage so that way Jeff Hardy could freaking debut! Who books this shit? So how dare you ask do you top that horrendous ass steel asylum match with the botched Jeff Hardy debut? Well, you proceed to go to monotone Kevin Nash cutting an interview for several minutes where he talks about Hulk Hogan was his first mentor in the business, which anybody that can add would say, how was he your first mentor when he didn't start working with him until really, honestly, 1996? Then we get a two-minute knockouts title match with a title change where the highlight was ODB doing the schoolgirl roll-up on Tara and pulling her trunks up so we could see a bit of that ass crack. But of course we didn't actually see the finish of it itself because the director cut away to some pre-recorded shot of the freaking Steel Asylum game because of course TNA would screw this up on the most important night in the company's history up to that point. Then you see a limo pull up and you're like, was this Hogan? They were showing the motorcade, is this Hogan? And out pops the nature boy, woo, with fucking flair. Where later on in the night, we're told that he went to see AJ Styles in his locker room, but obviously we wouldn't actually want to, like, see this. Let's just bother telling everybody about it. We have Mick Foley arriving for work outside of the Impact Zone at Universal Studios to where the security guards don't let him in, and it feels so awesome to hear Mick Foley talk about they won't let him go into work when you've got roller coasters as the backdrop for the video. <laughs> Bobby Lashley and his wife Crystal come out, and Crystal makes the demand for Lashley that he wants to be released from TNA and all these years later he's still there. The beautiful people which at this particular moment consisted of Velvet, Lacey, and Madison <laughs> they decided they were going to play strip poker and nobody cared. Scott Hall and Sean Waltman appear. Waltman may have been stoned pretty sure Scott Hall was drunk and the security won't let him in. Why are they there? Why won't they let him in? Why is this such a big deal? I don't know. We never really bothered to explain to figure out. 
Then, of course, throughout the whole first hour at different times, they're making this big deal about Hogan's motorcade coming to the impact zone. He'll be there soon. He'll be here in a couple of minutes. Of course, he's just circling around the roads of Universal Studios. But what the hell else? At one point in time, they show the thing where two limos are driving, and then all of a sudden, somebody gets out of the black limo to get into the white limo, and you're like, what the hell is going on here? Like, this whole first hour was just... It felt like they were trying to cram so much in. And you had three freaking hours! They tried to cram so much in that it really truly felt like absolutely nothing happened. So they created no positive impression at all that first hour. All they did was manage to look them, make them look, themselves look like a disorganized cluster fuck. So after that first hour of impact, we get to 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, which is going to be when Raw kicks off, and it's going to be Impact's second hour. And this was an interesting time, because you had WWE going out straight up with Bret Hart, and then Impact was choosing to counter, knowing that Bret was going out right away, or especially once they figured out Bret was going out to open the show as the guest host. They were going to throw Hogan here. And when you look at the two segments, starting with Raw, I mean, this is a big moment, a significant moment. I don't know if Dayton, Ohio is necessarily the best place to do it, but Bret Hart returns to the WWE for the first time in over 12 years and chooses to call out Shawn Michaels, and the crowd is pretty hot for this. Him and Sean do their little back and forth, as you would expect, talking about different things. It's weird to see Sean in kind of his DX gear while he's doing this work with Brett. You know, Brett, it looks kind of sad because this is not this proud, confident guy that we get, grew used to over the years growing up as wrestling fans. He was kind of a disheveled looking shell of his former self, if I'm being honest. But ironically enough, still pretty effective on the stick. You know, as Brett got to the tail end of his career, he had moments where he could be very effective on the stick. And I felt like on this night, especially in this opening segment, he was pretty good on the stick. But ultimately, the overwhelming feeling came over me, especially with me thinking that Survivor Series 1997, the whole Montreal screw job was the greatest work in the history of professional wrestling, is that ultimately, while this is a cool moment, and this makes, in theory, for great television... It's not like both of them are active wrestlers anymore. You know Shawn Michaels about to leave. Bret Hart can't wrestle anymore, you thought, because of the stroke. These are two old guys that are broken down shells of them former selves talking about shit that happened over 10 damn years ago. And as this whole entire segment is going on, I'm like, at some point in time, can we move on past this crap? Who cares? Let's talk about now and the future, not shit that happened over a damn decade ago. And I understand for a lot of fans it may have felt therapeutic and ultimately it was a great moment to see Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart shake hands and bury the hatchet on television after all those years, hug and embrace. And then ultimately where the real money was for all of this on this night was Bret calling out Vince McMahon and where Vince ultimately didn't show. I thought it was a really good start to Raw especially if you had just sat through that first hour of Impact and you were trying to determine which show you were going to stick with the rest of the night. Now, when you get to Impact, on the other hand, running up against this, you've got Bret Hart's promo on Raw, his return to WWE 12-plus years after the screw job. Here's Hulk Hogan coming out to some generic-ass NWO rip-off sounding music. He has finally come to TNA. And note the part where I was talking about the whole first hour, they're emphasizing how his motorcade's driving around. Apparently somebody forgot to clue in the holster, brother, as he immediately proceeds to talk about how he's been watching and talking to the talent all day in the back. How the hell were you doing that if you were driving around in a motorcade and you just got to the freaking the venue? How are you sitting here talking to the talent in the back all freaking day? Like, where's the continuity here? Where's the logic or the common sense anyways? Hogan really kind of cut a generic ass type of I'm here and we're going to a whole different level with a fixation and an overemphasis on trying to take down and overtake WWE and stepping the game up and TNA's going to a new level and da 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 da. And then after they had finally got in earlier in the first hour and they just let pe these guys get their ringside seats, 
freaking here comes Hall and Waltman. Hogan eventually lets them come to the ring. And we're talking about a bunch of old shit that happened in the past. Reminding everybody this used to be the NWO back when wrestling was arguably the coolest it ever has been. Now it's not about that anymore. Let's think about how good it used to be and focus on the crap that we have now. Is basically the way it came across. But if drunk Scott Hall didn't already blow it earlier on talking about Easy E, eventually out comes Eric Bischoff. It's Hogan, it's Bischoff. Bischoff's talking about times have changed. Him and Hogan are talking about how people got to grow up. They're sitting there talking about the format of the show, and I thought it was great when they were asking for the format Bischoff did. It took somebody a long time to actually find the format and bring it up, because again, why would anybody have been prepared for that? Why the hell would we know what we are doing? Because we were TNA, and this was Impact Wrestling back in 2010. Not that it mattered whether it was 2005 or 2015, it made no difference. This is the type of poor execution you would expect from this company. But ultimately, as they're talking about this and they're talking about that, is just blah. Like this should have been Hogan and only Hogan. If this is how you were going to start him off, if this is how you were going to feature him the first time, how you were going to introduce him to a new company, a new audience, this needed to be him and him alone. You didn't need Hall and Waltman talking about old crap. We didn't need to blow our load all in one night, which is really what it felt like they were trying to do. Desperation meant they were throwing everything at it. Eric Bischoff should have been a later addition. He should have either came later on in the show as kind of a cliffhanger thing, or he shouldn't have been on this show at all. But ultimately, when you look at the opening segments for both of the shows, it felt like Raw scored a pretty big win. While Impact... This was big and significant, and from a viewership standpoint, was a massive success. Going up against Raw, I believe this segment, the highest rated segment of the night with Hogan, drew like a 1.8 rating, which was like 2.2 million viewers. This was a massive, massive success for the company in that night, encapsulated in and of itself from a viewership standpoint. Spike TV wanted results. Hogan on that night absolutely delivered results. So in and of itself, that made it successful for them. Just from a wrestling fan standpoint, it felt like what happened on Raw with Brett and Sean was more significant, more consequential, and had a much better flow and structure to it. So back on this night, January 4th, 2010, while Off the Rope show was still uh, several months, almost a year away from its formation, I was watching it with Tony, with Mr. Rout, with the Green Meaning. We had all pulled together to watch this night because we thought it was going to be a big freaking deal. And throughout the course of the entire night between laptops and between TVs, we were watching it all at the same time. So it, it was interesting because you had to pick and choose at times what you would focus on, but you didn't want to miss anything in case something else happened. And I really miss that feeling about professional wrestling. I really do. Not saying I have to have that feeling back again, but I do miss it. I miss that thought of, if this isn't good, I could flip here, or what's going on here? I'm curious. Let me see. And we just don't have that anymore. But what happened on the rest of Raw? Um, I'll say this. is There were some bad moments, yes. But man, it is striking going back and watching eight years ago even. Even 2010, which ended up being a really, really bad year for WWE from a product standpoint at least. It was fascinating to go back and look and see how much different the feeling was. Part of that, a big part of that, was that Raw was only two hours then. Um, but... Man, night and day difference, even back in 2010 at the beginning uh, compared to now. Like you look at the January 1st, the New Year's Day edition of Raw in 2018, and then you go back and watch this one from January 4th, 2010, you'd be ashamed or embarrassed to say that's the same company that put up the same product. Uh, you, you would say they would be embarrassed, though, about the Maurice versus Brie Bella match because this was when Melina had gotten hurt, so they had to vacate the Divas title. This match was bad. This match was cringy and, thankfully, very short. Miz comes out and has a face-off kind of with Maurice and starts dirty talking her, and we find out later down the road that he was doinking her and he eventually married her and put a baby in her. Congratulations, Mike. Until she eats you and snorts you out of house and home. It led up to a four-way U.S. title number one contenders match. Think about the participants of this match. MVP, Swagger, Carlito, and Mark Henry. 
The only one technically still with the company is Mark Henry. Just think about that. And he's not even really on an on-screen capacity at this point. This eight years later. None of these guys are really there in any way. Uh, MVP ends up winning this, which is ironic because it was a couple months later, WrestleMania 26, if you remember, when Jack Swagger, the Swagger won the money in the bank on WrestleMania 26. you got to get the spit out if you're going to do the stuff on the ass, right? But this was an early part where you really started to see that The Miz was going to be something, that he was starting to figure it out, he was starting to get it, he was really starting to grow as a character and a performer. Uh, then we eventually transitioned into a backstage conversation after Jericho and Sho were talking about their rematch for the Unified Tag Team Championship tonight, and if Jericho loses, he's kicked off of Raw. He comes face to face with Bret Hart, and the interaction between these two guys was really good. Jericho talked about his time in the dun dungeon and his kind of revisionist history. Bret Hart talking about how it was Jericho screaming that scared the cats and all of this other stuff. It was really, really good. Like Bret Hart in kind of casual conversation mode can actually entertain you a little bit as a talker. He really, really can. Which led up to the Unified Tag Team Championship match between DX and Jericho. Well, let me point out first that there was the backstage uh, skit earlier where you had Hornswoggle and Triple H was promising him all of these WWE Mattel toys if he was a good boy tonight. And then he was, Sean was asking what he was doing with Hornswoggle, talking about he's not a kid, he has a freaking beard and so on. In comes Santino, dressed as Jericho's, talking about how he's the best at whatever it is he does. And then Triple H goes, get him. <laughs> Sports awful yokes up Santino. <laughs> you miss that type of fun shit. You know, back in the day when Hornswoggle was pushed more than 90% of the roster, and frankly, when you look back, probably deserved it. But DX Jericho. Like, they spent a lot of the first hour of the show building up to this being a big match, a significant match, an important match that actually had a reason, a purpose for happening. Like, everything on this show had a story, a purpose, a meaning, a significance for happening. We just don't get that now, but at least on this show you did. So you can talk about going back to the 90s or the early 2000s of watching Raw and thinking about how it's night and day better. You can go back to 2010 and see even with its flaws and issues how much better it is than 2018. Holy Christ! But DX Jericho, really good match. DX wins. Jericho, na 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 na. Hey, 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 hey. Goodbye. He's off of Raw. Then we get backstage with a knock on Vince's door and we find out it's Randy Orton. And it, that storyline consistency of less than a year ago, it was Randy Orton that was sitting there RKOing Stephanie and attacking the McMahon family. And Vince is sitting there and castigating him for this and talking about the temerity, the gall of you to come up and interrupt me. How dare you do that? Orton makes a proposal about how he can help with the Bret Hart situation. And Vince doesn't want anything to do with it. Like a heel and a heel going back and forth. And this heel doesn't want anything to do with this heel because this heel remembers what this heel did to his family less than a year ago. Oh my God, it makes logical sense and it freaking works on so many different levels. And then Orton kind of gets the boom dropped on him by Legacy. We're talking about if he doesn't win tonight, he's going to be out of Legacy. Remember Legacy? Yeah, exactly. And now Orton's the only one left. Uh, then we get Sheamus. Uh, Cuts a promo talking about Cena and how Cena can't beat him. Out comes Evan Bourne to challenge him. And you all know how that ended very quickly. But even in that case, you give Evan Bourne a quick hope spot. And then Sheamus squashes him after that. And Bob's your uncle, you're done. How about that? And then you get the reminder of the passing of Dr. Death Steve Williams. Man, it was eight years ago. That, the time goes by really, really quickly. So that's kind of a somber mood. And then your main event match for the night was Randy Orton versus Kofi Kingston. This was not the night of stupid, fucking stupid, fucking damn it. That was the January 11th, 2010 version of Raw where that happened. But still, after all of this, you look back and this was the one thing that really, truly pissed me off about the show is going back and seeing the potential of the possibility of what Kofi Kingston could have been, what Kofi Kingston was potentially aiming to be. And now thinking eight years later, the suspect ass shit that he's doing, yes, he's over, but he is still in the mid card of the company when so many other lesser talents have been pushed to the freaking moon and the top. And it was because Orton killed his goddamn push. 
because Kofi prepared for an RKO when he was supposed to get ready for a punt. Big fucking deal. Didn't have that much of an impact on the story. Fuck Randy Orton. But still, a decent match. Orton wins because did you really think he was going to put Kofi Kingston over at this point? He did it once. He wasn't about to do it again. So outside of the main event, that was pretty much what happened on the rest of Raw. And when you look back through the scope of history, it actually seems like a decent Raw. Because almost everything had purpose and consequence. You had the appearance of Bret Hart for the first time in the company really in over 12 years. You still had some big stars on the show. It makes 2018 look like a joke. And then we get to the rest of Impact. Which pretty much proceeded to be the train wreck that it was for the first hour throughout the rest of the night. The match of the night beyond question was the Knockouts tag title match. You had Sarita Taylor Wilde versus Awesome Kong and Hamada. Got the most time out of any match out of the night, which was strange, and it was easily the best match of the night. Uh, you had another title change. Remember, they used to have Knockouts tag titles. Awesome Kong and Hamada won. Yeehaw. Good match. Good solid match. Then we cut to Mick Foley still not being allowed to get in. Then eventually we get to the Nasty Boys not being allowed to get in either because why do we need the Nasty Boys other than Knobs and Sags or Hogan's Boys? Because that's the vision of the future for the TNA product is the freaking Nasty Boys. Then we have Hernandez and Matt Morgan squash Stevie Richards and Raven in 30 seconds. The Pope was pimping on the mic, on, of course, until Orlando Jordan showed up and screwed everything up and crap got really weird. Then once Pope was able to dust himself off and get back to pimping for the people, he squashed Desmond Wolf in less than three minutes. Because of course we would. Then eventually we get to Bubba the Love Sponge ultimately lets the Nasty Boys in because A, yes, let's let the Nasty Boys in and then not follow up on it the rest of the night for whatever the frick reason. And then yes, we need Bubba the Love Sponge because this is Hogan's boy. Let's just love Bubba the Love Sponge in. And he just let the Nasty Boys in. Like he let Hulk Hogan into his wife. Because we needed Bubba the Love Sponge. Why? And it was so bad at one point in time. Where earlier on, like, JB was doing something. He had been there for years, and then all of a sudden it's, here's Bubba the Love Sponge. Hey, Jeremy Borash, fuck you, I'm Bubba the Love Sponge. Like, who gives a crap? Then we get Samoa Joe beating Abyss in a few minutes because the originally advertised match of Rhino versus Abyss in a barbed wire massacre match never happens because Rhino gets taken out. And of course, every time somebody's taken out, there's Bubba the Love Sponge right there. And then eventually, Mick Foley finally gets in to where before he ultimately gets to a chance to where he can actually confront Hogan, which was the whole premise of the night. He walks into a strip pro poker game with the beautiful people that has now been joined by the formerly known as Val Venus, where he's only wearing a towel. But the whole point I'm getting at here is, after almost three hours of television, they played strip poker, and nobody's freaking naked! Because, again, we cared about continuity, right, Russo? Like, who wrote this shit? And the whole thing about throwing out the format. If this was the format you would have actually come up with, you should have thrown this one in the fucking dumpster and set it on fire. So, running up head-to-head -head from the 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Time, you know, you were getting all up to both shows' main events. Impact was going with Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles. Because ultimately, again, as announced by Eric Bischoff earlier in the night, why wait until the pay-per-view where you expect people to pay money for this pay-per-view quality world title main event type of match? Let's just randomly fucking throw it out there to culminate this three-hour episode of Monday Night Impact. Whereas Raw was going to be main evented by the face-off between Vince and and Brett. And both of them have their strong points. And both of them were really good in their ways. When you look at Vince and Brett and their face-off, you know, you're talking about so much history there, positive and negative. You're talking about the orchestrator of the Survivor Series, Montreal Screwjob and Vince McMahon, and the victim of said Montreal Screwjob, Brett Hart. So as much as you want to talk about Shawn Michaels was a pawn in that. He was still ultimately a pawn. 
Vince was the puppet maker. Vince was the chess master. He's the one that moved all the pieces, supposedly. So it makes sense. And it was kind of cool to see these guys in a ring together for the first time in several years because you knew deep down there was some type of heat and resentment there, no matter what you think about Montreal and the screw job in Survivor Series 97. There's still resentment there. There's still some heat there, da 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 but it ultimately comes down to, even though it was cool for Vince to sit there at that time and announce that he was going to put Stu Hart into the WWE Hall of Fame, and they were appearing to be the hatchet at one point, it's ultimately two men talking about shit that happened a long time ago. Two old men talking about old shit that happened a long time ago. And, and if that was the case to bring the actual closure to it, then so be it. But we ultimately know what does happen, which is Vince, at the very end of it, kicks Brett in the fucking guts, which ultimately creates a two-plus-month build between a match to the two of them at WrestleMania 26, because that's exactly what we needed to see to get a payoff to this, right? It was not the way you wanted to see Bret Hart go out on his terms in WWE. It was terrible. And looking back and knowing that this is what it led to, it just makes it so much worse. And then when you go to Impact, Kurt Angle, AJ Styles. Well, it was a bit of a Japan-style match for me where a lot of false finishes and let's hit all of our crap multiple times. Um, and I'm not always a huge fan of that. I'm okay with it on this show at this time because you're trying to deliver the goods. You're trying to sit there and say, hey, in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of all of this, we've got these two freaking dudes. We've got two of the very best in-ring performers in the business, in the world today, and Kurt Angle and AJ Styles. AJ Styles is our champion. Kurt Angle is a former champion. If you tune into this product, you can put up with some of this other stuff. You're going to get the gold that is Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles. And it was really, really good. And it was a real quality world title match that belonged on pay-per-view, but was ultimately given away here for free because, of course, it was. But during the match, out comes Ric Flair, who stands there and ultimately just really distracts away from the action and then ultimately, in a couple minutes, turns around and leaves. And it's like... It's cool that you're bringing in Ric Flair, and it's cool that you're kind of guiding him towards AJ Styles, but it felt like having Ric Flair appear, if you weren't going to sit there and mention that he talked to AJ Styles, then maybe you should have actually shown the stuff with AJ Styles earlier on the night and put the complete emphasis and focus on Kurt Angle and AJ Styles in this match. AJ beats Kurt. They have their great sportsmanship moment. Hogan comes out to put them over big time on the microphone. Not that it was needed or it was called for, but not necessarily saying it was a terrible thing to do. Like Hogan talking about how these two guys just raised the bar, brother, and putting them over, talking about taking it to a whole different level, brother. You know, you say it so much, you start to lose credibility, especially when it doesn't happen. But at this particular moment, on this night, on this show, it felt like a great way to end the show. And if that's how you end it with Hogan putting these guys over and saying... Having him say, this is why I came to TNA, this is why I want to be a part of this, is because of guys like Kurt Angle and AJ Styles. I was the past, they are the future. That's a perfect way to cap the night. Absolutely no complaints. But of course, because it involves Hogan and Russo and Bischoff and every freaking buddy else, they just couldn't stop here. Somebody comes out from the back, security whatever, runs and tells something in Hogan's ear to where we now have taken all the emphasis away from Kurt Angle and AJ Styles in the ring. There's Hogan awkwardly running to the back with his bad back to where before he gets there to his destination, we see Foley actually go into his office and there's Eric Bischoff somehow. He freaking got back there to Foley's office when Foley's not allowed to get in the course of the entire night for some particular reason that is bizarre to me. And then apparently Bischoff drops the hammer on Foley talking about how Foley is no longer the executive shareholder of the company like he had the power to do this. How the frick does that happen? How does any of this work? Foley's talking about he promised he would never work for Bischoff again, and if he's going to get fired anyways, he might as well beat Bischoff's ass. That actually made some logical sense, to which the old fucks in their 40s and 50s come in and beat down Mick Foley, where the show ultimately ends with Hulk Hogan sitting there, looking at what happened, kind of going like this. And it's like, ugh! You could have went in one direction. And it wouldn't have been the be-all, end-all, but it would have been a great cap on a big historic night for this company. 
but they just couldn't help but put themselves over. It was about Foley, it's about Bischoff, it's about Hall, it's about Waltman, it's about freaking Hulk Hogan. It's about everything that it shouldn't be about because this company always was stupid in that way. So that was Raw, and that was Impact Wrestling for January 4th, 2010. And eight years later, you look back and you, you wonder, who really won the night? Now, the easy answer is WWE, because they're the much bigger company. They have must, lost a much smaller percentage of their audience and fan base than Impact Wrestling TNA has in that eight-year span. The WWE still performs at big arenas. They still have prime time national cable that matters and you see what the old TNA has become now and it's a shell of itself it's hardly recognizable and it's sad but eight years later it's kind of sad to look back and see just how much things have changed for both companies like even looking back at Raw in 2010 and comparing it to 2017 2018 the difference is night and day and while I'm comparing two hours of television to three and that makes a difference. That's not the only difference and most certainly not a good excuse for just how strikingly different it is. But you look at TNA at this time, their number one flaw was that inferiority complex of wanting to be bigger than they really were, wanting to compete with WWE. And it's ultimately that obsession with competing against WWE that really took away from where the focus should have been, which was improving themselves and getting themselves better to a point where they could legitimately compete with WWE. They wanted to hot shot this crap and they wanted to do it right away. I mean, just couldn't help themselves. Like having Hogan debut, you should have kept it on Thursday night. You should have had three hours on Thursday night. You're on your own. You're not going up against Raw, at least. You're on your own. If I recall correctly, it wasn't SmackDown on Friday night at that time anyways. So you truly would have had your own night? Or even if you were, you were going up against SmackDown, the lesser of the two shows for WWE? You should have stayed in your own time slot. You should have stayed on your own night. Trying to sit there and go head-to-head -head Monday night it was just a disaster. It was a total unmitigated disaster. And ultimately... While initially there was a bump with Hogan and Bischoff and everybody coming into the fold, it was too much of the same old crap of focusing on the old guys, not focusing on a new path forward, on new stars, not trying to build new stars. And then you get to a point where you really wonder what the identity is, and it's a bunch of guys in their 40s and 50s and sometimes 60s arguing about shit that happened 10, 20, 25 damn years ago. And you look at the company now, and you see the farce that it is compared to what once was, and it was really sad and heartbreaking. Because, man, there was a buzz in the impact zone that night. This was a live show. They were three hours. You had freaking Jeff Hardy debuting. Ric Flair's coming. Hulk Hogan's coming. Eric Bischoff shows up. You know, when you look at some of the other talent that was already there, the Kurt Angles, the AJ Styles of the world, you know, you have Hogan pooting the fucking founder. He out baby faced the fucking founder. You thought I wasn't going to mention it. Well, this is my only mention of it. Tough. I don't feel like doing an AJJP. If you don't know what that position is, then that's your fault. But damn it all. They were so fixated on trying to compete instead of being fixated on competing with themselves and becoming better themselves and really ultimately to their detriment. And then WWE, you know, they still exist. They still profit. But in a lot of ways, product-wise, they feel like a shell of them former selves. As much as I see people still try to defend them and make excuses for them and try to justify why they watch what they watch for this company, believe me, even going back and watching this Raw from eight years ago, it clearly feels like an inferior product today. Like, that's not just revisionist history. That's not just um, kind of longing for the nostalgia of the past. It's a fact. You go back and watch that and watch now. It's night and day. So... The simple answer is, I don't know if anybody won this night, other than the fans. For one night, we had that illusion that there could be competition again. For one night, we got to relive the mid to late 90s again. For one night, we got to think about the possibility of there being a second major wrestling company and a viable, legitimate one that you could be proud of and not ashamed of rooting for and being a fan of. For one night, 
you thought about the potential for a new boom period in wrestling. And that was for that one night and that one night only. It really felt like this was a multi-promotional, cross-promotional, you know, independent of each other promotional type of one night only show. It's fun for what it was. It was fun while it lasted. And that's about that. So I hope you've enjoyed this retro wrestling review looking back at Raw and Impact from January 4th, 2010. I'll do another retro wrestling review in a couple of weeks. You can leave your comments in terms of what you thought about this night, what you remember about this night, you, who you thought had the better night, the better show. Um, you can also make your suggestions for the next show you want me to review for this retro wrestling review. And remember here, I'm the Schleg Daddy, and this is OTR Essential, where it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And go to Pro Wrestling Tees and buy the official OTR Central t-shirt.